Welcome to the fourth and last part of lecture one. Now we're going to be talking about controller behavior. Hopefully by the end of this uh, part of the lecture you'll be able to understand the basics of automatic control from the standpoint of design giving a, given a particular plant G. And we're going to take a look at the individual components that make up most modern control systems and, and what the, their characteristics might well be. And uh, we're going to examine typical combinations of these components used in control system design. And then finally, we're going to describe a general control design process applicable to most systems. And uh, the details are really what um, is going to tie up the rest of the semester. OK, for a problem objective, usually we'd carry something in here and say, all right, this is the kind of problem that you might be able to solve by seeing the end of this. But it's more general in nature uh, for this particular lecture. We're going to introduce the basic building blocks of controllers. And really, as such, I mean, any of the control systems we're going to be talking about um, would pr provide you with an example of, of a problem that could be addressed by what we're going to talk about from this point on. With controller actions, usually one is provided an existing plan G. So you have some sort of control process that, it, that you're wanting to, to uh, take care of here. And you need to have a controller. And the, the whole point of this course is actually, what do we put in here to get output that we want based on some sort of input? So we measure the output, we we'll translate the output signal into a form comparable with the input, and we we'll form this error signal. And that error signal is what's used for the controller. If we modify the error signal with additional components to obtain the performance needed to, with the controllers and compensators, and uh, we could even modify the system with additional loops. But we'll talk about in here uh, three basic controller actions and two different kinds of compensators. Uh, the three different kinds of configuration for controllers, a series or cascade compensation as shown here at the bottom. This is a, a series uh, arrangement where the controller is placed in series with the control process, or we often call it plant. Um, you can have the feedback compensation, where instead of having the controller uh, in series with the control process, it's actually in the feedback path. And then we could also have what's called a state feedback compensation, of which we'll talk about later on when we do state space control, where we actually, instead of feeding, uh, doing anything more with the, um, the plant itself here at C, it actually we feed back um, the state variables. Right, as inputs into the system and uh, work on those with our controller. There are other controller configurations like series feedback com compensation. Uh, we have a, one controller part on the, the series side and then you have a, a, one other part of the controller on the feedback part. You can have what's called the feed forward com uh, compensation. And interestingly enough with the feed forward compensation you're unable uh, to affect the roots of the characteristic equation of the system meaning that you can't really move the poles around with feed forward, feed forward compensation. Um, and the way this is shown here is, is that you have the, the series or cascade controller in with this feed forward compensator. Um, especially as of late, this has been really a popular way to do things uh, for processes that are otherwise difficult to, difficult to control. OK, so the very basics. One, a system's complex conjugate poles of the closed loop transfer function lead to an underdamped response to a step input. And you'd sort of re remembered that, I hope, whenever you look at the, the S plane, right? Um, if you have a pair of poles here, these actually give rise to an underdamped response to a step input. If you have poles along the, along the, uh, along the real line, then those don't do anything except other than modify the steady state behavior of the system or the or the long-term uh, damped response of the system. They don't provide any oscillatory input, output, I should say. If all the system poles are real, then the response to step input is, uh, by definition, overdamped. However, zeros of the closed loop transfer function may still lead to overshoot, even if overdamped. So you can have an overdamped system, um, and if your zeros are placed uh, incorrectly, the system can, can overshoot. If you're wanting overshoot, then you can place extra zeros in. Um, uh, to strategically uh, have this occur. System response is dominated by those poles closest to the origin in the S-plane. So par poles farther left, so say you have a pair of poles over here, they decay faster. They're less relevant 
than the ones that are closer to the origin, like these two poles here. These are the ones that you usually most often have to worry about. The farther left the dominant poles are, the faster the response to the system. But if the farther left these poles end up being, the, the dominant poles I should say, you'll have larger internal signals and such a system will be more expensive. So for example, if you look at the, um, the poles say of um, a sports car, the sports car can accelerate faster but the more powerful engine is much more expensive. When a pole and a zero of a system transfer function nearly cancel each other, the sense system response from the pole will be weak. Pole zero cancellation is a tricky art at best, and it's something that's dangerous to do. So, for example, if uh, you have a in a system, you have uh, your your controller, and then you have your plant. Suppose the system has a pole at the origin, and you say, "Well, I'll be smart about it. I actually put a zero in my." my controller and then so then this will cancel this out when you combine these two together well this usually the controller is in some sort of different type of phenomena than this for example an electric motor then this is electromechanical whereas if this is if this is an electric motor then this will be purely electrical what if the temperature changes? Then your electrical system might actually shift, but your mechanical system might not. It means your pole zero cancellation won't work anymore. It's really dangerous to do that. Okay, basic actions. You can have what's called proportional, integral, and derivative action for your controller. A proportional uh, controller action um, is one in which the output is proportional to the error uh, in the input. The integral. The controller action output of the controller, I should say, is proportional to the time integral of the error, which is the input to the controller. For a derivative, the controller action is proportional to the time derivative of the error. So if we look at, uh, if we look at these different systems, you can have a type 0 response, a type 1 response, type 2 response, and so forth. But for, say, for a type 0 response uh, to a proportional controller transfer function, is simply uh, the output divided by the input is equal to k sub 1 and that's our proportional controller and we'll see what the steady state error to the step say a step input might be turns out that if we if we look at this and what we'd end up with for a unit step input we have a, a unit gain into our system and say that this system has a, is a type 0 system. Notice it's s cubed plus 13s squared plus 32s plus 20. As an example, all right, then we get some sort of response. And have, for example, we end up with quite an oscillatory response out of this particular arrangement. But then if we increase the gain dramatically to, say, 170, then this, the response is no longer oscillatory and it's quite damped. And furthermore, the steady state error is, is quite a bit larger. So instead of having a relatively small steady state error from a unit step input, which at time equals zero, it, it goes from, at time equals one, I should say, it goes from zero to one is the command. And you see that the system with the gain of one actually responds, but it gives you a small steady state error. And a system with uh, gain of 170 actually gives you a large steady state error. The magnitude of the signal fed into the plant is proportional to the error. It's intuitively and physically simple to have a proportional controller in series with whatever plant it is that you have. So um, most importantly though is it won't change the system type. Okay? So if you have a proportional controller in series, it will not change the system type of your, of your plant. If on the other hand you have an integral controller, onto a type 0 response. The transfer function for an integral controller is usually something 1 over s and would represent integration. And we put in a, an additional proportionality constant here. So we have k2 over s. And what ends up happening typically is because of the integration, you have a long rise time and then hunting um, about, about the response, um, about the desired input because of uh, slight error in the integration process which delays the response. The magnitude of the signal fed into the plant is 
magnitude of the signal fed into the plant is based on a continual time sum of the input signal. So therefore, it'll continue, continue to supply an output signal until the input signal is gone. It's generally a slower response than uh, the proportional controller by itself, and it will increase the system type. All right. So unlike the proportional controller, this uh, integral controller will increase the system type. A derivative controller, um, in contrast to an integral controller, has a very short rise time. It's a rapid response, but it's also very unstable uh, to, to a step input, say. Uh, so a type 0 system with a derivative controller, uh, the transfer function for the derivative controller um, is K3S, where K3 is some sort of constant. And so you have a, a quick uh, response, but then um, and it dies down towards um, zero error, but then it will take off and the system will be unstable. The output is proportional to the rate of change of the input for a derivative controller in series with a type zero plant system. If the input is changing rapidly, the output will also change rapidly. There will be a very quick, respo quick response. The sensitivity is poor, however, and will allow the output to drift and slowly accumulate change. In other words, um, your steady state error will just almost certainly go to, to infinity with an arrangement like this. And it will decrease the system type if it's not already type zero. Ideally, we'd use a combination of these controllers because the individual forms uh, can be used, um, though in combinations actually will end up giving you a better result. A proportional action can be used alone, in particular, if steady state error is not a problem and we are low on funds. It's not unusual to use just proportional action um, by itself for inexpensive items where you don't really care about steady state error. Integral action has uh, oscillatory or hunting problems. Derivative action has instability and drifting problems. And as I said, the, usually the combinations of these forms are used to give you the best response. Here's an example of proportional again. This is uh, with 170, uh, gain of 170. Notice the oscillatory response, and it's very close to um, what actually responds to the input. The input is, as shown here, we come up to time is equal to 1, and then it should go up to 1. That would be our input, and ideally the output would look very much like the input. It's trying, but it can't quite do it, and there is a finite steady state error there, isn't there? Okay, so steady state error of about 0.1 for this arrangement. And that's for this particular system. You notice that the plant is type Zero. Now, what happens with uh, these plots is different depending on the type. Okay. If you decrease the gain, you know, as uh, we plotted earlier, what you'll see is that the response is actually, oops, actually not so good. With a steady state error, is almost 0.9. Proportional plus integral. The transfer function um, is k1 plus k2 over s, okay, where well, there's a proportional and then the integral. Okay, so you have a PI controller, k1 times s plus k2 over k1 divided by s, if you like. It has oscillatory motion of the integral controller, but with decreasing amplitude okay, because of the fact that you have the proportional, um, uh, in proportional part in there. So a PI con control is also said to be a low-pass filter, and that's for those of you that happen to be uh, associated with electrical engineering and mechatronics. So it has a medium long rise time as a consequence of having an integral controller in there, and there is oscillatory behavior again because of oscillate uh, because of the integral controller, but uh, it does it doesn't have uh, hunting nor does it have any steady state error. That's partially influenced by the proportional controller. Here's a PI example, and the yellow line is uh, what we had before, and the red line is the new controller. So this is this is P, and then this one is PI. You'll notice that the PI controller, eventually, the, e, the state state error is zero for it, um, in contrast to the old P controller. Same plant, type zero, no state state error. If we look at a proportion plus derivative, the uh, the response is rapid, stable, but it does have a steady state error. The PD control is essentially an anticipatory control, meaning that it anticipates the behavior of the, the system through the derivative component, and it, it has also what's called a high-pass filter. 
The transfer function for the proportional plus derivative, well, there's your proportional part and there's your derivative part, k1 plus k3s. So that's k3 when we factor that out, s plus k1 divided by k3. Here's a response. You notice that that the, with the yellow line, again, is the old system. That's the old P controller. And this is the PD. You notice that the response is far faster, almost a step response to the step input but we go down to a very, very large steady state error. If you look, on the other hand, at a type 1 system, notice that we have an extra S in here, so this is type 1 system. Okay, so I've changed the system type. And if we look at the, the yellow line, the yellow line response is just a proportional controller, a gain of 43.35 over here, okay, so that system. Notice how much quicker the PD controller is. The PD controller is, uh, is better, and because of the fact that this type 1, we have a 1 over S term in here, and the D means that we have an S, extra S in the top, those two cancel out, means that we end up with a zero, zero steady state error. If you put all three together, proportional plus integral plus derivative, you end up with um, quite a nice uh, transfer function here, k1 plus k2 plus k3. So in comparison to the previous setup, we have actually three gains to adjust now. And therefore, it is the most complicated of the arrangements. Um, PID controller is either a band pass or band reject filter, depending on the settings of k1, k2, and k3. It do, will have a short rise time. It will be generally rapid and non-oscillatory and then offer no steady state error because it combines the best of all three controllers and then the worst of all three controllers um, actually uh, are canceled out due to the combination. I'm presuming you get your settings right. Okay, so no compensation. This is the original system. Notice the type zero. And then if we put on the P PD control for the purple line, right, there's our controller. We have the 5.34 times quantity S plus 55.92. And so we have a zero at 55.92. And then we have the proportionality there. Quick response still has steady state error as shown here, right? So we still got a steady state error here from where it's offset from one. And if we go to PID control, we actually put in an extra zero there, and we put in the, the integral, and you'll notice that the steady state error and eventually works out to zero. Commercial controllers are available uh, for PID control, P, uh, PD control, PI control, and so on and so forth. Um, and you know, don't always think that it's electrical in form. You can find a variety of kind of controllers. A typical um, it, you know, here at the university, for example, there are a lot of doors that uh, have hydraulic openers and closers. The little screws that uh, adjust the valves, those are essentially proportional and integral control. Uh, you're adjusting the K1 and K2 values and the PI controller that that represents. If you're looking at, um, you know, at pneumatic devices, you can take a look at this web page, www.smcworld.com. And PID controllers are most common of all, really. They permit adjustment of all three of these parameters that are most flexible. This is an example of such a system. Um, if you look here, this is actually the controller, and you have all these little screws that you can adjust with the screwdriver, and then can hook up um, like a, a linear uh, displacement sensor and have power supply over here, and then the input and outputs and so forth. Well, most important thing I want you to see is, is what kind of steady state error is willing to tolerate between 5 and 25% error. Um, the derivative gain, proportional gain, an integral gain, and then what's called the main gain, which is essentially another proportional gain, and at a dither level, meaning that when it actually responds. And it's actually, this, this one is not so important for what we're talking about in here, but it's more important for digital control. Because this is, this is actually a digital control board, but notice it's also called a PID controller. Okay. PID and PD controllers are, are fancy low-pass and high-pass filters, respectively. And we could actually call these by different names. Um, they're actually in two different two uh, different classes, phase lag 
and phase lead controllers respectively. So PI is a phase lag controller and PD is a phase lead controller respectively. Phase lag and lead controllers compensate via placement of an additional pole and zero in the system. So it doesn't just place a pole and a, uh, or a zero. It actually places both a pole and a zero in the system. We'll use these more than anything else in this particular course because they're most straightforward to try to try to work out. To commonly, commonly use compensators out of many varieties are first order lag and first order lead. The order means that, um, for example, we'll say we'd have S plus Z1 is just written here below, but S plus Z1, whoops, divided by S plus P1, and we could indeed have a second order lag or second order lead by having another zero and then another pole. But, you know, to do that, uh, we first need to learn about just doing this once, let alone actually throwing in additional complication. So let's ignore this second order lag, second order lead controllers for the moment. Talk about first order lag, first order lead. Okay, so the transfer function of both compensators can be written as, okay, notice the C here, G sub C is equal to some sort of constant times S plus Z1 as your zero, and then S plus P1 as your pole. Now, this is important to remember right here. P1 is greater than Z1, then you have a lead or high pass com compensator. Your pole is farther away from the origin, it's a lead. Pole is closer to the origin, it's a lag. So closer it means lag, farther means lead. Lag and lead compensators add both a pole and a zero to the system. Again, for lag systems, the zero is left of the pole, farther away from the origin. Pole is closer for lag, pole is farther for lead. For lead systems, the zero is right of the pole, closer to the origin. Let's look at first order lag. Transfer function uh, g sub c of s is equal to k1 s plus a divided by s plus a over alpha. And then with just a as some value and then alpha is, oh, sorry, where alpha is greater than one but usually not much larger than two. So the pole and zero aren't too far apart even though um, in this case with their lag, right, the, the zero is closer to the origin than the pole. Is that right? Is the zero closer to the origin than the pole in the lag controller? No. For lag, remember, S plus A, let me look at this, S plus A over alpha, alpha, this is between 1 and 2, so this value will be smaller, the pole is closer. So if you look at the S-plane, the pole will be closer than the zero. All right. The rise settling time is longer and state state error is lower whenever you use a first order lag uh, controller on uh, a system. What ends up happening is, is the first order lag uh, controller in, appears to increase the damping of a system. Okay. So let's look at an example. Series compensation. Plant transfer function is shown here. It's a type 0 system with a gain of 158.1, just, just because, okay? Then if we look at uh, compensator transfer function, um, and then what we have is S plus 0 0.111, and then um, we placed our pole at 0 0.01. So if you look at this, what we end up with is for just our compensator, something like this. Um, our pole is here and our, our zero is way out here. The difference between the two is, uh, the ratio between the two is 11.1, .1, which is fairly high. Um, okay, so you look at the, the original system, okay, and in yellow, and uh, the result uh, with pink, and the, si the response is a bit slower. Notice that the response of this pink system is a bit slower than the yellow system, but another nice thing about it is is that ESS is, is zero for when we actually use the lag controller. Okay. A lead controller, first order, is the same sort of setup, but notice that we've, instead of putting alpha in the denominator, we put alpha in the numerator. Alpha is greater than one, but usually not much larger than two. Again, the pole and zero are fairly close together. So in this arrangement, then we have the zero, then pole. Okay, that's for lead. All right. So lead has a zero closer to the origin, 
pole the farther away. Decreases the rise of settling time, but has no effect on the steady state error. So um, it affects our dynamic behavior, but not the static behavior. So if we take a look here, then, then the original system for a different plant is the response to that is actually shown here in yellow. Okay, so it's K over S times S plus 4 times S plus 6. Notice that it's a type 1 system. And the response is shown here. And then we have, um, after we put in the compensated transfer function with the 0 at S plus 2 and then the pole at S plus 8.9, so you have a zero here at uh, minus two, and then you have a pole here at minus 8.971. And then we also have a, a DC gain in there as well. But what turns out to happen is, is that our response is far better, or far quicker, I should say. Notice that. And uh, that's how we can make use of a lead controller. Turns out that it's, you know, one of the things you're able to do with all of these things is, is actually construct circuits to represent all of these controllers using operational amplifiers. And I know if you're like me and I'm working in mechanical engineering, when you say operational amplifiers, it means nothing. But um, it's something to keep in mind. And it's actually not too difficult to actually build these sort of circuits for yourself and, and then actually make use of them for electromechanical systems. So the idea is, is that we have this input voltage and then we have an output voltage. And this entire system is our controller. So say we have uh, for our output voltage, that's actually what you would originally, that goes into the plant, okay? And maybe in your original setup, you would actually try to drive this with, uh, you know, a, a, a battery or a voltage or something with through a, through a potentiometer or something to adjust your response and then get some sort of output. But you're unhappy with the output of the plant that it's giving at the moment. So what you do is, is you actually put in as an input the difference between the output, okay, and what your desired signal is, or your R of S. So then R of S, subtract off your C of S, if it's part of your output signal, and you get your input uh, signal into this controller, and you put that into the plant. Now you go to resistance, or an impedance, we say, and then we have an a impedance that goes directly in series with the, this entire circuit. Then we have an impedance that's on the feedback loop of this op amp, and then the positive side of the op amp circuit, and remember the op amp here is set up in this way. And if we do that, we say that Z1 and Z2 are R1 and R2, then we actually end up with a simply a proportional controller. It's a P controller, okay? And the proportionality is minus R2 over R1. If you want an integra integral controller, an I, then 1 over RC divided by S, where you have your R and your C values, and that's Z1 and Z2. So you have your Z1 and Z2, this would actually be a resistance, and this would be a capacitance. All right, differentiation? Well, you, you swap the two, don't you, from the integration in your circuit setup. A PI controller? Well, you have a resistance and a capacitance. It's funny how that works, a gain in integration and they just put these two together at, at Z2 um, to get your, your setup in a PD controller. Well, you put the resistance and capacitance together on Z1 and use your resistance from the gain on the other one. You can, I hope you can probably figure out what a PID controller looks like. And yep, sure enough, it's C1, R1, R2, C2, and you have all of this as your constants. You can also do lag compensation and a lead compensation as well to get everything set up. All right. So, for example, if you implement a PID controller as shown here, S plus 56.42 plus 27.96 over S, you can compare all of these different values. Then and it's often easiest to work with the specific capacitance because the capacitances don't come in so many different values. Resistances, you can combine those together to give you quite a variety. And then we end up with this arrangement for our circuit to actually make this PID controller. So if you were to actually hook this up, and uh, try this out. This would actually represent this PID controller. You can make this for yourself. Okay, some sample problems. We have uh, plant GCP is equal to 10 over S squared plus 3S. What's the system type? Is it stable? What about compensation? If we use the compensator of S plus 4, what kind of compensation is this? And if you know what kind of compensation it is, then what kind of response are you going to get? There's the original response of the system. 
what are you going to get? There's a response with the compensator in pink. Quite a bit better than the original system, isn't it? No state state error. And by the way, that's to a step input. Here's another one. System type, is it stable? What about the compensation? If you use this compensator, what kind of compensation is this? And once you have that, then what kind of response is it going to give? Here's the original system. Is it stable? Hmm, I wonder. This is a, with a compensator in there. Notice the pink is with a compensator in comparison to the original system in yellow. So, now that we've seen all of that, that's really all this course is about. Well, the problem is, is that, well, how do you pick all these values? How do you know what K1, K2, and K3 are? How do you know what your resistor capacitor uh, value should be? Which controller? Is it P controller you should use? Should you use a D? Should you use PDI, P, or PID, or PD, or lag, or lead? What, what about all this stuff? The idea is, is that uh, that's, that's what this course is all about. We're going to figure this out over the next five or six weeks. And along the way, go through uh, some of the things that hopefully we were supposed to have picked up in, in third year and do a few new things along the way as well, talking about state space systems and uh, other stuff. Okay? These Simulink files that you've just seen are up on the website. Try them out. If you have a chance, go and try, try them out in Simulink and MATLAB and uh, see if you can get the results to plot as I have. With that, that's the end of this, and uh, hope to see you in the Practical and Computer Lab. Thank you.